This video is going to review bonding and transition metal complexes um, that you had in previous courses. Uh, we're going to start off with, uh, again, all, all be octahedral. We're going to look at sigma bonding. An example may be cobalt with six ammonias. So what I have here are the, uh, the metal orbitals. Uh, and obviously we have the 3D orbitals and we have a 4S and 3, 4P orbitals and their relative shapes as shown here. Um, um, so there are three of these particular orbitals, dx, y, dy, z, and dx, z. So now let's look at add the uh, ligand orbitals. Now we're going to have to come up with six ligand orbitals because we're going to form six, six bonds essentially to the metal. Yeah. So here they are. And if you think about it, the, the ligands will have um, six orbitals. They're shown here. One is sort of considered like an S orbital, three P's, and two um, D orbitals. Um, and P orbitals, again, there are three of them. And the D orbitals would be the equivalent of like dx squared minus y squared and dz squared. So these would be EG orbitals. So if you think about it, uh, there's only going to be six um, bonds to the metal, uh, and two of those bonds will have to interact with the EG orbitals on the metal. So let's see what happens when we bring these together. And note, of course, these orbitals are lower in energy for the ligands than the transition metals because we're talking about maybe 3D electrons and 4S and 4P. So let's bring them together to form some MOLs. So we're going to form MOLs, and I think you can see that with the lowest MOLs are going to be bonding, and then we're going to have uh, anti-bonding and some non-bonding. Um, and the bonding ones are would be between, for instance, the 4S and the A1G, which is S-like. Uh, and then we're going to have three uh, T1U orbitals, which are equivalent to interactions like with the 4P, with like the P orbitals on the ligand, and then um, the the metal orbitals. You know, there are the EG orbitals. What we're going to have are two of those: uh, the dz squared, dx squared minus y squared can interact with the EG orbitals from the ligand. So again, we have these six bonding MOs. Um, now what's left over are the T2Gs on the metal. So they're going to be non-bonding. Uh, let's say there's no electrons in them. So they're non-bonding. Uh, but of course, uh, as we use the EG, two, um, the two EG orbitals, and those are shown here, okay, uh, the DZ squared and DX squared minus Y squared, because we use those to form the bonds uh, with, the with the ligand orbitals, we have the EG bonding orbital down there, but then we're going to have the EG anti-bonding orbitals higher up. So, I mean, a lot of people just to consider these as just, just the ligand orbitals, but remember the top uh, two are the EG uh, non-bonding orbitals. Um, now, of course, when we, um, if we would put energy in, uh, and if we did have electrons in the non-bonding T2Gs, and then we would put a little energy in, we could promote them to the EG anti-bonding, and that's the delta value of the field, um, at the splitting energy between uh, the T2Gs, which would be non-bonding and the anti-bonding EG. So that's the case when we have um, sigma bonds, six ligands interacting with a metal center on an octahedral geometry. And I, I think hopefully that should make sense. Now, in some books, I've actually seen the nature of these orbitals um, altered a little bit so that Sometimes there's a switch between the T and U, like the equivalence of the P and the A1Gs. Um, so, um, yeah, so that's something that uh, I've seen. I'm not exactly certain uh, why, but those uh, switches are sometimes seen in books. <laughs>